Welcome back to Talking Dragon Age, the show where I talk about Dragon Age. Today we're looking over the Hawk family and their hidden significance. I should mention that while I will discuss Leandra Amel, I'm not going to go into the extended Amel family, such as Sherrod, Gamlin, or the Human Circle Mage. So, starting with Hawk's father, little is known about his early life. We know he was Ferelden, but he was brought to the Kirkwall Circle of Magi in the late Blessed Age. Malcolm had a unique natural talent for magic that set him apart from his fellow apprentices. By the time he was 14, he was casting rather complex spells. Then his progression slowed to match that of his peers, eventually undertaking his harrowing when he was 19. To a casual observer, he was an average mage. Almost too average. Senior Enchanter Consuelan believed that Malcolm was intentionally hiding his talents so he wouldn't stand out from the other apprentices. Because as we all know, it isn't wise to stand out in the gallows. One of Malcolm's instructors, Enchanter Ursula, had this to say about the young Malcolm. A rare talent. A sharp and curious intellect. He seems to understand magic through gut feel and instinct. I'm sure the entire gallows has heard about how he conjured fire on his second try. And as all other apprentices labor over the spell, the little scamp says to me, they think too much about moving their hands when they ought to be thinking about moving the fire. If I didn't like the boy so much, I would hate him. I too had trouble with that lesson as a child. In 905 Dragon, a banquet was held for the visiting Grand Duchess Florian, niece to Emperor Florian of Orlais. All of Kirkwall's high society was present, including the young Leandra Amel. Kirkwall's Circle of Magi sent four mages to provide entertainment, one of whom was Malcolm Hawk. That was the night Malcolm and Leandra met and fell in love. A few nobles spotted them on the balcony, speaking with their heads close together. Leandra had been born to Aristide and Bethan Amel, a powerful family in Kirkwall at the time. She was schooled in music, politics, history, and even riding and archery. She was close with her younger brother Gamlin throughout their childhood. At the age of 11, she was betrothed to Guillaume de Lance. Upon first meeting him the next summer, she told her mother, They are so very Orlesian, Mama. For the months following the banquet, Malcolm would sneak away from the circle to meet with Leandra. Two people played a vital role in helping the young couple meet. A friend of Malcolm's named Sir Maurevar Carver, a Templar, and Leandra's younger brother Gamlin. After a few months, Leandra discovered she was with child. Malcolm had dreams of marrying Leandra one day, but this revelation made things very, very real. He asked Leandra to run away with him, and she agreed. They wed in secret, and Malcolm and Sir Maravar Carver planned an escape. Malcolm's phylactery was stolen, and Malcolm made it to the docks looking for a ship to help him and his wife. After begging and pleading, Leandra's brother Gamlin gave Malcolm a list of names of captains that might be willing to help, along with some of Leandra's jewelry to pay for passage. But thanks to rumor and gossip, Leandra's father discovered his daughter's pregnancy and was furious. He spread word that Malcolm was a dangerous apostate and hired men to track him down while forbidding Leandra from leaving the estate. However, she was able to get a warning to Malcolm by way of her younger brother Gamlin. Malcolm was faced with a choice. Either board the ship and leave Leandra behind, or stay and take the risk. He chose to stay because he's awesome. I'm just going to interrupt the story here and say this would be a fantastic short film. I'll write it if somebody wants to animate it. Well, Malcolm hid in a low-town tavern to plan his next move. This was when a Grey Warden named Lorias approached him. He needed a skilled mage to travel to the Vimark Mountains to perform a blood magic ritual to bring a powerful darkspawn under control. Lorias told Malcolm that either he helped and the Wardens may aid him in his flight from the city, or he refused and he would never see Leandra again. Not the negotiating tactic I might have used, but Larias was a warrior, not a diplomat. Malcolm had objections, but had little choice. He left a message for Leandra that 
simply said he had gone to buy their freedom. Malcolm returned after helping Larias, and Larias upheld his promise, and helped them to escape. Under protection of several wardens, they went straight up to the Amel estate and ordered Leandra be brought out. There was no reply at first. Leandra's father made one final plea. She could stay and have the baby, who would be a welcome part of the family. She would not have to marry anyone if she didn't want to. Or she could leave with Malcolm, and neither she nor the baby would be considered part of the Amel family. She chose love. Eventually the door opened and Leandra was standing there alone, with no guards or other family members. When asked, Leandra just said her father was letting her go and wouldn't pursue them. When asked if there was anything Leandra needed to bring, she said, I have everything I could ever want. That night, they boarded a ship and sailed to Ferelden. They settled in a town near Amaranthine, where Malcolm worked as a farmhand and Leandra sewed torn clothing. They kept their origins a secret. Leandra would send letters home, but received no replies until, when the twins Bethany and Carver were born, she got news from her brother that their father had just passed away, as had their mother the year before. Bethany's magic developed when she was nine, and she had tossed a bully clear across a field without even touching him. This forced the family to have to move again, this time settling in Lothering with only what they could carry. They lived peaceful lives and were happy. Malcolm unfortunately passed away from illness three years before the fifth blight. Leandra was devastated, but remained strong for her children. Growing up, Carver always felt like he was in his older sibling's shadow, and so they didn't really get along. Carver loved fighting. Before he joined the army, which was after his father passed, he essentially taught himself how to fight. His father gave him some pointers, though not many because his father wasn't a trained warrior either, and he watched occasional mercenaries sparring and adapted their style into his own drills with things like wooden swords. He wanted to be a warrior to protect his family, and although he wouldn't admit it, he also wanted the glory. He wasn't the most disciplined when he first joined. He was actually a bit of a brat, but he learned. He had attitude, but he was brave like few others. His captain praised his ability, his valor, and his courage. He was a terrific soldier because he wanted to be there, and his commitment was unrivaled. His captain had to physically pull him back at Ostagar and convince him to flee. When they were clear, they went their separate ways. Now, in sharp contrast to her twin brother, Bethany was a quiet girl. She trained in magic with her father and picked it up well. Even when she eventually goes to the circle in Kirkwall, her instructors remark on how well she was trained. She was sent to her harrowing right away and passed without incident. Back in Lothering, when she wasn't with her family, she liked spending time in the Chantry, learning and praying and listening to stories. One particular Chantry sister stood out to her. Now, I am going to read something directly from the world of Thetis here, because I couldn't say this any other way. I found her like we found most. Scared. Uncertain. The onset of the ability can terrify the mage most of all. But she was not unloved or unprotected, and did not need me. And that is to the credit of the father. We talked for a time, made sure he had what he needed for the training of one with her potential. And then I went on my way. Or so I let them think. We watched, as is our wont. The Hawk children were blessed with all manner of ability, but they did not bear it equally. Of the champion, you know, the world knows, and also the boy Carver. Denied magic, he wanted nothing more than to be special. But Bethany, sweet Bethany, you could see it in her every movement how she held the fire of the arcane as far from her heart as possible. She did not want to be special. She wanted to be normal, or what she perceived as such. We spoke of that many times, I in one guise or another. Sheltered as she was by her own doing, she reveled in stories of the far and away. Tales of the courtly life she might have had, had she not been denied the name Amel when it was of note. 
The father had hid the history of that well enough, and she could only dream of knights and the simple duties of court, and of princes. <laughs> My goodness, did the child know the names of storied princes. I believe she danced with a book once, but then the best of us have. The father coached Bethany's power with clear pride. The thread of magic tied the family together. His death was undoubtedly hard, especially as it was to simple sickness. But that too was a gift of his, in a fashion. We of talent often think we can bend the world to our will, and we are especially helpless when reminded of our limits. It could have broken her, made her open to the failings of our gift. But Bethany did not break. She was masterfully reserved, a trait many mistake as weakness. Restraint is a flavor of command. Holding power within is the foundation of focusing it outward. Her training continued without his instruction, perhaps even without her knowledge. And that is where we could have returned to her, if not for the blight. If the father's death removed anything from the girl, it was the comfort of shared experience. For normal is a function of the company you keep. And among her fellows, among those who suffer the same trials, she would have found both peace and power. I believe Bethany would have excelled in a true circle, in a proper fraternity. Equitarian by choice, I should think. Though I suspect, like many, she would have surprised herself with leanings to the libertarian. We've said as much to many others. We tell them not to be afraid, and they never are. We tell them to pay attention to what the circle teaches, but pay most attention to what it doesn't. And we tell them they will see us again. And when they do, glory. And now you know what we are willing to say. Do not pursue further, as we will not respond in writing. So, somebody out there, known only as Said, was watching out for Bethany her whole life. Disregarding how bloody weird and disconcerting that is, it is so cool. Because one of my favorite characters, just for her character, is now the center of a mystery. And we all know how I feel about mysteries. So who could this person represent? Could be wardens. The letter states that they made sure Malcolm had all he needed to train her, and Malcolm accepted that. Though I don't recall any other mention of them evaluating someone for recruitment from childhood to adulthood. I'm sure it happens in the Anderfels commonly enough, but in Southern Ferelden, that's weird. Not impossible, and I wouldn't even say unlikely, but weird. There's something special about Bethany that made her worth this person's time. If not wardens, then just based on the secrecy and interesting phrasing of the letter, it could be the executors. And no, you cannot convince me to call them the executors. Because we know so little about the executors, we can't be certain why they were interested in Bethany specifically, as in what they may have wanted her for. What's odd is that the letter mentions how Bethany continued her training without her father, and that is when they could have returned to her, if not for the blight. The blight that happened three years after her father's death. What were they waiting for? Her to finish her training? Couldn't they have, you know, gone to her anyway? If it was the Wardens, it would explain why the Blight would have drawn them away. But at the same time, wouldn't they have wanted her then even more? If they were worried about the joining damaging her, they could have simply escorted her out of Ferelden, maybe even with her family in order to convince her. Conditionally, she's put through the joining the year after the Blight. And I'd assume the warden watching her died in the Blight, if not for the fact that we have this letter sent to the investigators. And based on the last line, which we can reasonably take as a threat, they are ready and willing to fight and protect not just her, but the secret of why they were interested in her. Because these notes are written in a sort of neutral language, so this letter exists whether Bethany is alive or not, or is a Grey Warden, or was in the circle. 
These discrepancies in the Warden theory have me leaning towards either the Executors or another secretive faction. The Mages Collective is another possibility, although not nearly as fun or interesting. They talk a lot about being among those blessed with magic, but the threats... The threats and the talk of glory doesn't really sound like the Collective. If you have any ideas on who this mysterious Sade person is, definitely let me know in the comments. And I think that about does it. Man. The story of Malcolm and Leandra is wonderful. Carver is a better character than I really give him credit for. Bethany has always been amazing to me, and now that she has this mystery surrounding her... Come on, they have to take this somewhere. They have to. But a subtle point you may have missed through all this is what made Malcolm special. He had a talent for magic passed to Bethany, and his first child if your hawk was a mage. Presumably, that would also be true of any grandchildren of his. What is the secret of the hawk bloodline? Some bloodlines have a natural talent for magic. That kind of thing is nurtured in Tevinter. Could it be as simple as the hawks being naturally gifted? Or is there something more to it? Now, stay with me on this. Perhaps the hawk bloodline diverged from the Kalanhad bloodline. Kalanhad had gotten power from the blood of a great dragon, and his descendants still have that, although minutely. But we have never known a mage from that bloodline. Perhaps mage descendants of Kalanhad were hidden, because the Chantry would be unlikely to allow a mage on the throne. These may have been illegitimate children resulting from affairs, or were simply quietly hidden after their magic began to manifest. Thereby, the non-mage blood from Kalanhad's legitimate descendants was nurtured and resulted in a long line of non-mage kings, while his mage descendants became a bloodline of their own, eventually marrying into the Hawk family, or founding the Hawk family on their own. Either way. So in other words, Kalanhad's mage descendants were hidden and pushed away from the throne, eventually becoming the Hawk bloodline we know today, while his non-mage descendants formed the long line of monarchs that ruled Ferelden. And that is where I'll wrap things up. Didn't expect this to get so long, but here we are. Let me say, the, the theory that Hawk is a distant, distant cousin of Alistair and Caelan is a rather tinfoily theory. It's fun to speculate about, but there's honestly not much to it. Maybe the Hawk bloodline is just strong with magic. Or maybe there's another reason for it. I just think this idea is awesome. So if you guys want to talk about this, or anything else, uh, jump on over to Discord to chat with me and other fans and receive some behind-the-scenes content of some projects I've gotten in development. So that's it for now, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to comment and like, and remember, Tala Nadas.